Hey everyone, this is Evangelist Maria and I wanted to take some time today to teach you out of the Word of God about something that is so uh, widely discussed and that I get tons of questions about. And in fact, I posted a question box on my Instagram just a few days ago earlier this week because I'm doing this series entitled 21 Questions where we're taking very common, my mostly asked questions when I'm on the road that I get about the Word of God or about um, Christianity, about, you know, Jesus, things that are super common, questions or issues that have come up all the time that I want to dive into God's word with you and see what the word of God has to say and what we need to know about these topics and uncovering the truth from the word of God to help us better understand God and better understand our role in light of what the word of God has to say concerning these questions. So I hope these are a blessing to you today. The one that I wanted to talk about that I have been thinking about all week in studying for has been this question that came up um, really as uh, out of a discussion that I was having with my sister, this question of suffering and what does biblical suffering look like? What does it mean to suffer? Is sickness part of biblical suffering? Is hardship and trials in life part of biblical suffering? Um, what does it mean to suffer? So we're going to be breaking that topic down today. And I want to talk about suffering um, in light of what the Word of God tells us. And I want to actually play this video uh, because as I was saying earlier, my sister and I actually saw this video, which is what triggered this question and a huge discussion between the both of us um, in things we've heard people say before, you know, common questions that people have when we're out doing evangelization and soul winning. And uh, I'm going to let you guys watch this video and I want you to let me know what you think in the comments. But um, it's quite the video. So I'll insert You are here. about to get a whole new level of understanding of what it means when it says that you are the body of Christ. So Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So Christ's body was whipped, beaten, and tortured. And what represents the body of Christ today is the church, which is you and me. Now Christ actually took 39 lashes. And did you know that there is actually 39 categories of diseases? And by his stripes we are healed of all these diseases and all this affliction. However, we must remember that we may not actually be healed of our affliction or any of these diseases as it may be the very thing that keeps us humble and keeps us seeking God. So just keep that in mind too. Now, since the body of Christ is the church, you and me, we must also share in the suffering of Christ. So 1 Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice when you share in Christ's suffering, that you also rejoice when his glory is revealed, because when his glory is revealed, we are glorified with him. Right? So it says, If each one of us are a piece of the literal body of Jesus, so when Jesus was beaten, we are beaten. When Jesus was whipped, we are also whipped. So we share in his affliction, so that we share in his resurrection. I'm just going to say that again. We share in his affliction so that we share in his resurrection. So just as Christ was humiliated, so also will we be humiliated. But as he also was resurrected in glory, we also will be resurrected in glory. Now some of us were also chosen by God to suffer more than others. And this is to take up the lack of affliction in the church. So here in Colossians 1 verse 24, Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. There are many in the body of Christ that actually suffer little affliction, and there are many who suffer greatly. Those who suffer greatly take up the lack of those who suffer little. And that's why it's actually really important when, when it says in Galatians 6 verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ because someone out there is taking up the lack of the affliction in the body. So Christ suffered for your sin and my sin, and we share in this suffering with Christ. So um, that was intense. And uh, the guy brought up a lot of points in what he was saying. And honestly, in the beginning, I'm like, this video is starting off strong. Come on, 39 stripes, come on healing, come on categories of diseases. He was on the right path, but somewhere in the middle of the video, he derails. Um, goes off track and starts talking about 
the sufferings of Christ. And then equating the sufferings of Christ, which is what um, the Bible talks about out of the book of Colossians. He talks about Galatians 6 and bearing one another's burdens. And then he starts equating sickness and his personal battle with sickness, which um, with a preordained kind, kind of this sovereignty, sovereignty of God argument that a lot of people make concerning sickness and equating it with his version of the sufferings of Christ that he has to endure to keep him humble and to keep him meek and to keep him seeking after God. And the first thing that I wanted to hit while we're talking about the subject of suffering um, and why suffering exists in the world and number two, breaking news and spoiler alert that we've been redeemed from the type of suffering that he's touching on because of what Christ accomplished for us, not what he will accomplish for us one day when we get to eternity, the work that's already been finished, signed, sealed, and delivered by the very blood, body, and life of Jesus. So uh, I think we need to start to get a better understanding of what is truth and what is just feeling or tradition or been passed on because of poor teaching out of the word of God. We need to go back to the beginning. And so, you know, I, I thought, what is a holistic way to teach this and to touch on this? And I think the best way is to look at Genesis. Go back to Genesis. We were teaching this in a Bible study a few weeks back when we've been highlighting the doctrine of man and depravity of man and the wickedness that exists in the world. So most people's question is, why is there suffering on the earth or um, Christians have to suffer? You know, Jesus said that we're going to have trouble troubles and trials and tribulations. So what does that look like? And what does that mean for me? So I'd say, take it back to the, the garden, take it back to creation. And the book of Genesis says in Genesis chapter one, that God created man and in creating man, God said that it was good. He looked upon the creation that he had made and he saw that he was good. He created him. The Bible says in the likeness and then the image of God to be like God. So man was not created a corrupted being. Man chose and corruption entered into the world through man choosing to disobey and transgress against the law that God had given him to not eat of the the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's when a curse came into the world, according to the book of Genesis uh, chapter three, I believe, when uh, God says that curse will you be in your childbirth, I'll set you up at enmity between the man and the woman, that the man, the woman and the serpent would be at enmity, that he would multiply our pains in childbirth and by the sweat of our brow that we would work. That's the curse of the fall, the curse that came into this world. The Bible, you know, the Bible talks about that. And, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about this subject, when it comes to suffering, they bring it up. They're like, hey, we live in a fallen world. We're just going to suffer just like everybody else. No one's immune to it. No one can avoid it. No one can escape. It. But I want to tell you that that's just simply untrue because of the great promises and the great, not just promises, because that speaks of something to come, but because of the reality of what the word of God demonstrates to us and gives us and shows us. And because of what Jesus did for you and for me that we can partake of 1000%. In this life, yes, in the life that's to come, but now in this life. So I want to read you guys a scripture out of the book of Isaiah. He also read this passage um, in that video. And this isn't just like a rebuttal to that video. This is kind of taking a holistic look of what it means to suffer. But the book of Isaiah chapter 53, I think this was the first scripture he started with. And I'm going to start reading out of... Um, Verse one, and this is prophetically speaking of Jesus. It says, who has believed our message and to whom has the strong right arm of the Lord uh, been revealed? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. And this is the key that we're honing in on. Yet it was our weaknesses. This is NLT. But the KJV says it was our sicknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. Though we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced. Key verse. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Another translation says, and by his stripes, you are healed or you were healed. Verse six, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And the verse just continues uh, and goes down to speak of Jesus and to speak of the coming Messiah and all that he would endure 
um, in suffering, but not in vain. You know, the, the way that this guy talks about it is like, yeah, Jesus suffered and we're his body. So we're just going to have to suffer too. But there's such a stark difference between what we know, what's the mainstream Christian idea of suffering and what biblical suffering is. And so I just wanted to clear the air and clear the water because what Jesus did for us wasn't in vain. And what Jesus did for us wasn't just a model. See, he suffered. He was this, he was that. So we have to endure it too. No, Jesus endured it all. He became sin. The Bible says in Ephesians, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So Jesus put on death, Jesus put on affliction, Jesus put on sickness so that it could be lifted off of us. So that curse that came into the world at the fall of man could be totally broken. And that by his blood and that by his sacrifice, we could be totally and utterly redeemed. The Bible says, even in the book of Galatians, it says that Christ has redeemed us. Galatians three, from all of the curse pronounced by the law, be being made a curse for us, for the Bible says, for the law says, cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. And Jesus fulfilled that. He was hung on a cross. He, and the Bible says he literally became sin. He became the curse so that the curse could be lifted off of us. So let every single religious lie and thought that people have planted in your head, maybe for years and years and years, that the sufferings that are equated in your life can be equated with what the Bible calls a biblical suffering or what we know as a biblical suffering. It's just simply untrue. Jesus, the Bible says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who, with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Everywhere Jesus went, people were delivered. People were set free. People that were sick were made whole. And Jesus never put sickness on somebody to teach them about how to know God in a deeper way, to make them more spiritual spiritual so that they can endure the suffering of Christ. Why? Because it was something that he bore, that he would pay the price for. He would take straps on his back for. And the Bible says, if we've seen Jesus, that we've seen the father. So Jesus was the physical manifestation. The Bible says he was the visible image of the invisible God. So we look at Jesus and we can see the perfect will of God made manifest in the earth. And we can see in the word of God that it is not the will of God for you to be sick, to suffer with sickness. Sickness is a suffering. Sickness is a peril that comes on people's lives that, that causes you to live in suffering. And that's not the kind of suffering that we will endure as promised in the scriptures. That's something that you, that has been bought and paid for through your relationship with Jesus Christ and by his blood. And all you need to do is believe, 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 and receive that gift that God has for you through Jesus and his sacrifice. So that's what I wanted to clear up first, because a lot of the video had to do with that. And this guy talking about the body of Christ has to bear the burdens of the people that aren't suffering as much. Hey, we're clearing the air. So I wanted to get that out. And a lot of people have that false pretense of, I have to suffer because Jesus suffered and I want to be like Jesus. So I just need to be this like lowly, nobody cares about me kind of person. That's not the life that we're created to, that we were redeemed really to live. We've been redeemed to, to glory and to live, to manifest the glory of God on this earth. So I'm glad that we could hit on that and we need to learn. That's why I'm even taking time to answer these questions because we need to learn to discern biblically what is truth and what is tradition? What is truth and what is, you know, what my thoughts are telling me or what the enemy is putting in my head or what society has claimed as normal. So that's what we're clearing the air in. So biblical suffering. Now that we've taken a look from the beginning to the redemption, to the blood, to here we are suffering, right? So what is biblical suffering? You know, there's benefits included and you're serving Jesus and in your relationship with God. The Bible says in the book of Psalms chapter 103, bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits who forgives your sins, who heals you of all of your diseases and who redeems your life from destruction. Again, destruction is not a form of biblical suffering. You enduring these tribulations and these trials that have nothing to do with your Christianity or your being saved or you're taking a stand to live a godly life is not biblical suffering. And you have to learn how to identify the root and what it's coming from and why it's there. Could it be that it's been your oversight or a mistake that you made or a decision that you took that brought something in your life? Could it be that you've stepped out of your covenant with God and your relationship with God by engaging in things that the Bible calls sin, engaging in things that the Bible literally clearly lays out for you that will bring no benefit into your life, but that will bring calamity into your life. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. But the, the path of the righteous is like a first break of dawn that it shines brighter and brighter until the full light of day. So if your life is full of these afflictions and sufferings that don't mirror what the Bible calls is an affliction, a biblical affliction or a biblical suffering, trial and tribulation, 
then you know, hey, I don't think this root is from God and I need to learn from the word of God and receive revelation. That's what the Bible says that people perish. My people perish for lack of knowledge or understanding or revelation. So we need the word of God and we need to be full of the word of God and full of wisdom and understanding to identify what comes from God, what doesn't come from God. And if this doesn't come from God, then I don't want it in my life. I'm not bearing it as a mark of some fake spirituality or bearing it as a mark. Oh, I'm such a good Christian, so godly because I'm just suffering so much. Hail to the no. I, I'm living exactly the life that God said that I could have, the Zoe life, the God kind of life, the John 10, 10, abundant kind of life. If God said that I can have it, then I'm going to appropriate it in my life. And why? that's why we take time to teach out of the word of God for you to be to for you to be able to identify um, accurately and biblically, biblically what that looks like. So suffering came into the world. Jesus redeemed us from suffering. He didn't leave us without a solution. God didn't leave us without a solution. He sent Jesus into the world to atone for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made new creatures, and so that we could be redeemed, not just left in the condition or state that we were in, but so that we could be redeemed and so that the curse of sin could be lifted off of us. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, I'm actually going to read it to you. Hebrews 2, 3, it says, how then shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? There's many things in life that will never come off of you if you're neglecting so great a salvation. If you're overlooking what Jesus Christ has done for you, over spiritualizing it, over complicating it, and not going back to just the simplicity of what the gospel is, that Jesus came to the earth in the form of, and visage of a man, never sinned, and took upon himself the consequences for our wrongdoing. And not only did he pay the price for us to get into heaven, but he paid the price for us to live the God kind of life here and now. And so I want to step in now to, okay, we know that that's not the right kind of biblical suffering and I know how to identify it. And anything that doesn't line up with what the word of God says is biblical, is not, is not belonging in my life anymore. And from today, moving forward, I'm deciding to kick that thing out of my life. I'm booting the work of the enemy. I'm booting the work of maybe my own poor decisions out of my life. And I'm coming to God. Um, Um, you know, through the power of his word to receive mercy. I'm coming before him boldly to identify how I can move forward and how can I live um, a fruitful life in him. So I want to read 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. And this is such a powerful portion of scripture um, to really help you understand what this looks like. So 2 Peter chapter 1 Verses two through four, I'm going to read. It says, may God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. Another translation says, may grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Verse three, by his divine power, God has given us everything that we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. That's the key. We've come to know him. So we've received something. The one who has called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us these great and precious promises. And this is the key. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Another translation says, having escaped the corruption of this world through lust. So, you know, there is a corruption. This is really what I wanted to hit on. This scripture is so powerful and key because this is the excuse that I get all the time when I say, Hey, the kind of suffering you're talking about isn't biblical. The, the, the litany of comments that were on this video talking about, Oh yeah, that's right. This is good. No, the, these things are not biblical. And ha- how will you know you're neglecting so great your salvation and the, the Bible, this isn't just one off scripture. There's so many more that I could point out, but I don't want this to turn into a, you know, a 50 minute lecture. This is a video to help you and, and to teach you to gain understanding. But it's us being enabled through what Jesus did. We've been enabled to partake in his nature and we have escaped. That's what the Bible says. I have escaped the corruption of this world that's coming through lust. So never be tempted to say, oh, I'm just suffering because I live in this world. You know, I'm a human being. I live in this world. This is a fallen world. Yeah, you may live in this world, but the Bible even says, though you live in this world, you are not of this world because you've been born again. When Jesus encountered Nicodemus and said, you know, uh, I, I don't understand. You need to teach me more about the things that you've been teaching when you've been in the temples and Jesus said, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus goes, 
How can you go back into your mother's womb after you've been born again? And he said, you don't need to be born of the flesh. You need to be born of the spirit. So when you get born again, when you receive Jesus into your heart, when you take make the decision to repent of your sin and to give your life to God and to acknowledge, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When you make that decision, something happens and you exchange the nature that you put on because of sin that you were really born into because of the curse of the fall. You exchange that nature with the divine nature of God and his life comes to live on the inside of you. It comes alive on the inside of you and your spirit man is born again. And the Bible says, even though our outward is wasting away, that we're being renewed day by day. So we don't take uh, heed in these momentary afflictions, the things that are happening around us in this world, because this world is corrupted. They don't have the power to overcome the God in us. And God, but this is such a twisted thinking that God has to put you through some sort of trial and tribulation of things that he's already redeemed you from to teach you about them is just ludicrous because God, that would make God some sort of terrible stepfather, evil villain, twisted, sick person. And he isn't, he loves you and he has a great plan for your life. And you don't have to learn anything about God through destruction. You don't have to go out and taste the pain of sin or immorality and doing things your own way to learn so that you can learn your lesson. That's very carnal and human way of thinking, but God's ways are higher. And he doesn't teach you through destruction. You may learn through destruction, but you don't have to. And that's not God, how God teaches you. That's not his desire and his best for you because he loves you. God's desire is to teach you through instruction out of his word and to perfect you through his word and through the help of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So you've escaped the corruption of this world. Though you might be in this world, you're not of this world. The Bible says that you're an alien. You're a foreigner of this world. And then you're actually royalty. You've put on his divine nature and that you're to live in this world as he is to rule and to reign as a king in this life. That's what the book of Romans says. And that's what you're promised according to the word of God as a child, a blood bought child of God. Hallelujah. Jesus paid a very high price for your soul, for your eternity. And I don't care what any religious cow has said to you, what any religious person tries to convince you of, oh, that's suffering. You know, that's a prosperity gospel or that's a health, wealth and goodness gospel. It's I'm plainly teaching you out of the word of God, what the promises of God in, entail for you. So we know biblical suffering is none of those things, but it is this, you know, Jesus said this in um, John 15. I'm going to read it to you. John 15. In John 16, even Jesus said this, he said, in this world, you will have troubles or you will have trials. Another translation says you'll have tribulation. He said, but take heart for I have overcome the world. So many people stay in the, oh, you know, in this world, brother, we're going to have persecution in this world. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have all kinds of trials and troubles, but they neglect the second half of the verse, which is the best part of the verse, but take heart because I've already overcome the world. So there's no form of affliction, no form of trouble, no form of persecution. Again, in the correct context that we're talking about, according to the word of God that you could ever face or, or are facing now that Jesus has not overcome. He's already overcome. And all you have to do now, all that's left for us to do as children of God is to fight the good fight of faith and hold fast to our confession and to the profession of our faith and to believe and speak the word of God and to be full of the word of God and to be full of the power of God and be full and convinced that God is working all things together for our good, which he promised us in his word because we love him and we're called according to his purpose. So the Bible says this in the book of John chapter 15, Jesus, you know, these words are in red. So this is Jesus speaking. And he says this starting from verse 18. This is the kind of suffering that we're promised as Christians. Verse 18. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. Another scripture. You've been removed from the pattern of this world through putting on Christ. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is no greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this because of me. For they have rejected the one 
who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me or they hated him without a cause, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, and he will come to you from the father and will testify about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. So Jesus so beautifully puts it. Hey, believers, followers of me, the thing that I called you to do when I first called you to follow me, that thing that I called you to do, to take up your cross and follow me. When Jesus encountered his followers, he said, hey, come and follow me. Come and follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Come and follow me. You know, that's that's the, the beck and call of Jesus and that's what we have to carry. That's the 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 suffering, the biblical suffering and weight and trial and, and, and tribulation that we have to bear in this life. It's to bear the name of Christ and to share in the sufferings of Christ. That's actually biblically what the book of Colossians is speaking of. It's not talking about bearing sickness. It's not talking about bearing the consequences of your poor decisions. It's talking about the hatred that this world has for Christians, not just because of who we are, but because of who Christ is and the fact that they reject everybody in this world has fallen, um, into the, the spirit of this world and they're dominated by their flesh. They're dominated by their depraved nature and the wickedness of their nature and they hate God and they, therefore they hate anything that has to do with God and they hate anybody that's associated with God for no reason. They hate, you know, I, I've seen it in my own life when you make a decision to take a stand for Jesus and to take a stand for godliness and to live your life accord, in accordance with the word of God. There's all types of people that come from the woodwork to persecute you and to mock you and ridicule you for standing up for your faith or for living according to the word of God. That's precisely the type of suffering that's promised us. That's actually guaranteed to us. But the Bible says that we don't have to even mind them, that they're just the lightest of afflictions and that we should rejoice when we face trials. We should rejoice when we're persecuted for the sake of Christ, when we share in the sufferings of Christ, because what's being developed in us is perseverance. And what's being developed in us is our character. And what's being developed in us is a reward that the Bible says is promised to us in heaven for enduring until the end. And even the, the, the book of 1 Timothy talks about godliness being profitable, that it holds promise in this life and in the life to come. So this is precisely the type of suffering. Biblical, this is Bible suffering. I know that's like a nuanced, crazy word that people don't want to hear sometimes. But that's precisely the suffering that, that's being spoken about. And that's biblically accurate. According to the word of God, the suffering is the suffering for the bearing the name of Christ, for you being a Christian and living your life, not in the shadows, not part-time Christian, part-time doing my thing, but living a life on fire for Jesus Christ, winning souls, furthering and advancing the kingdom of God. That's your cross to bear. That's following Jesus. That's denying yourself, denying being like everybody else, denying going with the flow. The Bible even says broad is the way that leads to destruction. The easy way is to just go about life and to not even care about God, which is what most people are doing. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't even see God for who he is. They see him as a judge. They see it as, oh, that, that's gonna ruin all my fun. I'll get saved when I'm old. Once I've lived my life, once I've done all my partying, then I'll get right with God. And then, you know, I'll do my thing. I'll bear my cross of living a boring Christian life. It doesn't have to be that way. Yes, though, there's persecution guaranteed. Yes, that there's going to be trials and there's going to be uh, people that mock you. There's going to be people that challenge you because you're of your faith in Christ. You have a list of great and precious promises. You have benefits. You have a glory that you're going to share. And because the Bible says that straight and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And it's few that find it. But when you find it, there is such a joy in serving God. There is such a freedom in serving in God. I used to think, oh, I'm, I'm living my best life. I'm calling the shots. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm bad all by myself because I was serving my own desires, serving my flesh, but I was a slave. I was a slave to the desires of my flesh. I was a slave to the thoughts that haunted me in my mind every single day. And it wasn't until I came into Christ that I found a freedom that nobody could offer me, that I actually found true life, abundant life, that I wasn't a slave anymore to sin, that I wasn't a slave to the person that I had been, that I wasn't a slave to the things that had happened to me, that I didn't have to be a victim, that I didn't have to mindlessly and endlessly suffer through life, but that I can live a whole and per a perfect life, a life that's pleasing to God, a life full of glory, a life full of joy, a life full of purpose. 
and a life full of power. And that's the life that's guaranteed to you. In tandem with these sufferings, with you bearing the weight of serving God, putting your hands to the plow to advance his kingdom, your personal responsibility to see the gospel move forward and to live out your Christian life and witness in your everyday life, in your day to day, you're also guaranteed victory every time. You're also guaranteed to come out on the other side as a winner to come out on the other side victorious because Jesus Christ won the victory for you. So no matter the suffering that you may face in accordance with the word of God, you're building up a tenacity and a glory in this life and in the life that's to come and a reward for you bearing the name of Christ and for you professing him. The Bible says, even Jesus instructed people, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my father. But if you acknowledge me before man, I'll acknowledge you before my father that's in heaven. So we don't have to be ashamed of being saved. We don't have to be ashamed of bearing in these sufferings. We can rejoice in them. And But again, I don't want anybody rejoicing in any kind of unbiblical uh, suffering or any kind of root of any kind of curse or maldicion or, or the string of, of, of things that have happened in your life or in generations in your life you're cut off from those things because you've been cut off from your earthly family yes you exist in this world in an earthly family but you've been born into a new family and that's the family of God and today if you've never ever 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 had the 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 opportunity or made the decision to give your life to Jesus Christ, to be born into that family, to be born into the overcoming family of Jesus Christ. You've never repented of your sins. You've never taken, uh, there's never a time that you can remember where you've acknowledged that you've sinned, you've acknowledged that you've transgressed against God, that you've fallen short of his glory, like the Bible says. And the Bible says that there's a wage for that sin, that there's a payment that has to be paid for sin and that payment is death. But the Bible also says that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, and that anybody who would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And today you can pass from the curses that have been alive in your family or the, the, the cycles, the vicious cycles and repetitive cycles of sin and of failure and of promiscuity and of immorality and of living life with apart from God. All of that can come to a screeching halt today by you acknowledging God and by you receiving Jesus. So I want to give you this invitation today that if you want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. If you've never done it, or maybe you have, but you've fallen into sin, you've backslidden, you're far from God, you know that you're not right with God. And today you want to make that all right. I want you to to say this prayer with me, to believe in your heart and to confess this prayer out loud with your mouth. Say, dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Say, wash me, cleanse me, set me free. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you came to the earth and that you died for me. I believe that you're risen from the dead and coming back again for me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me power to live for you. Give me a hunger for the things of God and a boldness to preach your gospel. I am saved. I am forgiven. I am born into the family of God. I am redeemed from the corruption of this world. I belong to Jesus. Heaven is my home and I will never turn back. In Jesus name, amen. I want to congratulate you for making that decision. You can actually go to our website, weareremnant.com. That is the name of this ministry, Remnant Ministries. You can go to our website, weareremnant.com forward slash I just got saved and click the links there that will help you in your walk with Jesus Christ and help you on this journey of following Christ. But I just want to say congratulations today. All of your sins are forgiven. And remember that God loves you and that he has a plan for your life. And I want to take time to pray for you. Many of you, you've just been enduring senseless suffering for no reason, thinking that God had put sickness on you to teach you a lesson, thinking that it was your cross to bear, thinking that because you've done so many bad things that you just have to endure this suffering, that it's your lot in life. But today, as the light of God's word has gone forth into your heart and into your mind, you've been set free. And for many of you, you'll even feel now that you're healed, that you've been restored, that God has touched you. But for uh, everybody else, I want you to pray and I want you to just close your eyes and I want you to lift your hands and I want to pray for you. And I believe that even now, 
through this <laughs> camera lens that the power of God will come and touch you and set you free from every form of affliction, every form of bondage, every evil work, every work of the enemy in your life will be broken off today and every chain of the past will fall away. Every chain of shame and guilt will be removed and that from today moving forward, you will be free to serve God, free to live for him, free to live in victory, free to overcome in life. So Father, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Even now, I pray for every single person watching this teaching and this broadcast. Let them even now be touched from the top of their head to the very soles of their feet with the power of the Holy Spirit. I command every sick body to line up with the word of God that you've shown us that by your stripes, we have been healed, that you promised to take sickness and disease from our midst and that Jesus, whom we mirror ourselves after, that he went about doing good, healing all who were afflicted of the devil. I thank you for every oppression of the enemy coming off of your people. Even now in Jesus mighty name, I command their bodies to be healed. I command their minds to be whole. I command them to be made free from today in Jesus mighty name. And I thank you for it. I thank you that everything turns around for their good, that everything that looks like destruction, let it be turned around. Let everything that was uh, causing them to have senseless suffering, I think you let it be turned into glory. Let it be turned into a testimony. I think that you're going forth even now by the power of the Holy Spirit and you're making every crooked path straight, that you're aligning everything in their life to point towards your good and your plan, your perfect purpose for them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, guys, I hope this blessed you. I hope this clarified a little bit more for you. And um, I hope to, in the future, answer many more of your questions. If you have a question for 21 questions, you can always find me on Instagram. It's at the Karate Kid. Um, and our ministry Instagram is at We Are Remnant. You can always DM us something that you want featured on the series. I'm going to give you guys a little sneak peek in the weeks um, and days to come. We're going to be talking about sickness like we hit a little bit about today. We're going to be talking about what the Bible has to say about drinking and alcohol what the Bible has to say about the will of God. Can you know the will of God? Hearing the voice of God, we're going to talk about how can you stay on fire for God? That's a question I get almost everywhere that I go. How can I be on fire for God? And we're going to touch on that and give you practical application from the word of God as to how you can live on fire in this world as a blood-bought child of God. So I pray that today you guys are blessed. You can follow along with our ministry and with everything that we are doing online. And uh, if you want any information at all, the best place for you to go is to go to weareremnant.com. We are RMNT. It'll be right here on the screen for you.com. And you can find all of the information. Again, my name is Avengers Maria. And I pray that this broadcast blessed you and helped you and uh, just brought you into a full light and revelation of God's purpose and great plan that he has for you. A plan free from the oppression of the devil, from the sufferings of the world and the curse of this world brought on humanity. And that you can live free to serve God and free to bear rather the afflictions of Christ. And so I love you guys. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week and I'll see you on the next episode of 21 Questions.